Hello, listeners. If you've enjoyed these narrations, please click on that like and subscribe button. Full disclosure, I was an anti-mask during COVID. No, it wasn't because the infringe of mere freedoms, or that I found it hard to breathe. It was just that masks made my assignment, at the time, rather difficult. I'm a mercenary, you see. A gun for hire. I contract out through a shadow outfit based in the DC. Up until 2020, my jobs had all been sandy. The Sahel, Samalai, Afghanistan, poor places where the big governments like to play war. My jobs were the dirtiest of the dirty jobs. I did missions that militias wanted to be able to distance themselves from if something went wrong. It was only a matter of time before I got a fucked up contract like I did in Romania. A memo came in from Bucharest, asking from a dozen American contractors with combat experience. I didn't ask questions. The paycheck was enormous for what seemed like a cakewalk compared to keeping up with West's War of Terror. Or, I mean, War on Terror. Yeah, that's right. All twelve of us were given different arrival dates. When I landed in Romania, six soldiers from America were already there, and I suspected I'd have to meet up with them, but none of my suspicions turned out right. Upon landing, I was put into a taxi hired by the government, and after several hours without so much as a pee break, I'd stepped out of the car, all groggy with my black duffels and rifle crate. A swarth of great forest runs through the Romanians, following the Carpathian Mountains like a backwards L. I was now near the head of that L, but the Ukrainian border. I could hardly believe my surroundings when I had gotten there. I was expected to join a tactical team for a briefing. What I had found was a thatched roof shelter. It was wallless, a little more than a structure to give travelers shelter from the rain for a night. The shelter was stationed at the edge of the forest. It was some kind of checkpoint or resting point before you ventured any further into the woods. There was a single trail that snaked through the dark spurs behind it and disappeared deep into the forest. Something was definitely off about this assignment, but my mind didn't linger on what. I stopped for a breath. The fragrance of the carnivorous trees was a balm after six hours of smelling my cabbie's camel. But he himself wasted no time getting away from fresh air. The taxi driver slammed his door and sped off without saying goodbye. A spat of mud splatted onto me as a little car puttered away. I flicked a few globs of mud off my sleeve as I went to the shelter. And there, an old man tended a fire. Cross-legged, while the two grey-muzzled sheepdogs rested their chin on his legs. I did not speak Romanian. I reviewed the email instruction I received. All they said was speak to Bjorn once I had arrived at my destination. I knew I wasn't being played. My contractor has a system to verify all communications. It was confirmed that the Romanian government had wanted me here. But why? Bjorn? I asked and waited for an answer. The old man nodded. Sit, please. He gestured at a dry spot of dirt across the fire. I moved my bags in under the shelter and sat. I'm not sure if I'm in the right place. Oh, you are, he said. Where are the other soldiers? It's just you and me here. I laughed and shook my head. And what of our objective? I take it that there's a terrorist outpost in these woods? I pointed at the trees. Or... Are we after wolves attacking a shepherd's herd? The old man just stared at me until I blushed and looked away. His expression was a quiet damnation of my arrogance. When the silence had properly highlighted the stupidity of my last sentence, he spoke. There are many tribes in these woods. They choose to live life unspoiled. They cut wood, carry water, catch fish. They shunned the cities to live in the woods. He broke a few sticks in half and fed them to the fire. The dogs watched the new kindling crackle and burn before gently closing their eyes again. 
It wasn't always like that. One tribe was so cruel, so cunning. They were the Parazis. Parasites. They took what other tribes had instead of making things of their own. They had no fishermen, no smiths, no weavers. Only killers. This tribe, they, they adapted to kill and feed on humans. So they grew fangs. I nodded my head up, knowing where this was going. It wasn't Vlad the Impaler, but these sick beings that began the legend of Dracula. Uh, I see, I said skeptical. Well, you will come to know. Eventually, when nearly every tribe was wiped out, the Parazis vanished. Some say the devil took them to be his demons. Others say that they crawled into the earth to hibernate until more people populated these woods so they could kill once more. But the truth of where they went, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is that they're back. I stayed quiet for a moment, expecting him to laugh at my stoic expression, to say he was just fucking with me and that there was actually a terrorist cell hiding out in a cave. But instead... He kicked dirt on the fire, and the dog shot up and shook himself off. Come. We have several miles to travel before we sleep. Take only what equipment you need. Rifle, ammo. Don't worry about food. I have plenty. He started halfway down the trail while I stayed sitting. I thought about walking to the nearest village and buying a ride back to the airport. This was absolutely ridiculous, but who was I to complain? After all, I was getting paid the same. I assembled my rifle, slung it over my shoulder, and left the plastic case behind. In the next few weeks, I learned the world was a much bigger place than I'd ever imagined. There were full-blown cities in these woods, each ringed with the walls of spruce that has been sharpened to spikes and turning into hundreds of inhabitants. They made their own clothes, soap, and cookware. It was like I had stumbled through a portal to the medieval ages. I stayed with Bjorn off of one of the main roads that connected the village. He had a hut there, and I learned that his job was to act as a kind of highway patrolman. He taxed trade between villages and made sure the bandits weren't raiding the roads. But there was hardly any trade or traffic between villages when I started. The air was quiet with fear. Apparently a family homestead had been attacked a month back, draining their bodies dry. The whispers and rumors swirled that they were the Parazis, but none of them attacked were seen. With so much wilderness patrolling one road felt useless, but Bjorn said the legends were true, and in order for them to reach the village, they must be invited inside. They can't just sneak there through the woods. To be honest, the assignment didn't have my full attention. It felt like a joke, honestly. The other 11 contractors that were hired had the same job as me. They were assigned other patrols between villages. Bjorn did have a radio and no unusual activity had been reported by any of the other sentries on the road. That was, until one by one they went dark. It started further down the mountain range, but it was the outpost near the Serbian border. The woods of central Romania went quiet. It was making its way towards us. We used to get a wagon or two a day coming by the south, but all travel suddenly ceased. When the village caught word that communication with the south was gone, I thought they'd flee to the cities. Instead, they nailed close their shutters, barred their doors as soon as it was dusk, and loaded their rifles. It felt like something was coming. One day when Bjorn and I were watching the roads, a rickety wagon approached pulling by a pair of mules, their ribs bulged against their fur. Bjorn and I looked at each other and shouldered my rifle, I stepped out into the muddy roads. With not much else to do, I had dived into learning Romanian my first few weeks here. While I couldn't much speak it or read it, I could definitely understand the gist of Bjorn's conversations at this point. He did most of the talking while I stood tall and menacing with the rifle across my chest. The protocol for our road patrol was simple. Check the teeth of all person to make sure that they didn't have fangs, and second, make sure that there was no stowaways in the cargo. 
This sometimes meant that going through sacks of wool or piles of potatoes, but so far we hadn't turned up anything. The driver of the carriage wore a mask and stopped the mules. The beast stood dumbly in the road, blinking lazily. What is your business on these roads? asked Bjorn. I looked at the wagon, and there was four women in the back wrapping tight in their coats. Their shawls covered their faces. We are fleeing before the storm and the south can reach us, one of the men said. Bjorn walked closer and I followed close behind. What do you know about what happened in the south? Something is coming. We intended to cross the border and stay in the wilderness until the evil is past, the man said. Well, you can go no further without inspection, Bjorn insisted. As we expected. Bjorn gestured for me to go to the back of the wagon. The women all wore masks too. I mean, this was 2020 after all, and COVID was taken seriously here. The people knew if there was an outbreak in any of these remote villages, there would be hardly anything town doctors could do, and many would die. Show me your teeth, I said and held my mouth open in a smile with my pointer fingers. One by one, the women pulled the heavy shawls from over their eyes and showed me their upper teeth. But even before I looked at their fangs, something about their movement, it bothered me. They moved rigidly, robotically, like there was something wrong with their arms. The women held their mouths open funny, too. Their lips were perched and curled up so I could see. They didn't smile like you would for a dentist, but there were no fangs, so I assumed it was okay. The last two women who showed me their mouths had fresh blood running from their gums. I indicated that they could let their masks down and I walked back over to Bjorn. I pushed him back a few steps so that we were out of earshot of the driver and I whispered in his ear. There's no fangs, but something seems off. Some of the women, their, their gums are bleeding. That's not uncommon, especially when travelers know we're checking teeth. They brush them hard to be polite but I agree that that is strange. But they don't look like the Parazzis. Their teeth, they do look real. But what if, I don't know, what if they stole regular people's teeth? Bjorn gave me a funny look at this. Did it look that way to you? He said. I thought back and to be honest it didn't. Their teeth hadn't been replaced and if they had then... They had phenomenal dentists. I just shook my head at him. May we go into the village? Asked the driver. Bjorn and I just looked at each other. We were both on edge. If I weren't for our anxiety, it was possible we might have found nothing out of the ordinary with the inspection to begin with. Bjorn just waved him on. You may go. Safe travels. The driver raised one arm in farewell and... Bjorn and I both watched him with skeptical squints. And there it was again, that strange robotic movement. We stood in the road while the mules plundered on, listening to the cart moan and creak until they were on the hill and out of sight. That night, Bjorn and I ate supper in silence. I was getting paid weekly, so there was no completion cause for my contract. I remember I was thinking about leaving that very night when Bjorn and I looked up at the same time. There was a sound in the wind. A wailing. We bursted outside of our huts where the noise was clear, and we could hear it. The nearest village was almost three miles up the road, but we heard the screams clear as day. I started gathering my things, and Bjorn was already sprinting. As we got closer, we could smell smoke and see the orange glow of flames flickering in the sky. In the time it took us to get there, the screaming had ceased. The gate to the village was wide open. Bjorn and I slowly walked silently the rest of the way. The village still made noise. The fire leaping hut to hut was crackling, whistling and roaring. We got to the mouth of the gate and I froze. My combat experience didn't prepare me for this terror. Their speed to a firefight. A forgetfulness of fear. But this had me shaking like a child. There... Inside the gate were the bodies of the coach that had just passed us hours earlier. The man and the four women. 
Bjorn bent down and turned one of them over, and we both jumped back at how easily the corpse moved. It was weightless. I set my rifle barrel against the chest of one and proded with it. The entire chest was empty. No organs, no bones, it was, it was like that for all of them. Their legs and arms were hollow tubes, and their heads. God, they'd been cut in two and stitched back together. The Parazis, I said aloud. They massacred them when they got to the village. They, they were already here waiting for more people to come. No, said Bjorn, stepping backwards. No. He started to sprint our way into the woods. Trojan horse, he shouted back at me. Hey, Bjorn, wait! But I stayed still, realizing what he had meant. It was why their movements were so mechanical earlier. It was why their gums were leaking blood. The Parazis had emptied these humans out, spooled out every last ounce of flesh and stuffed themselves inside. Oh, fuck. Oh, no, I said while beginning to follow Bjorn. You see... It was our fault. We were the ones that had let them in. <laughs>